So this is the first of two lessons on the assessment of vital signs. In this first lesson, we're going to specifically look at the vital signs and how to take them. And then in the second lesson, we will focus more on when you use and how you go about assessing vital signs as part of a more systematic evaluation. So the first thing to look at when assessing vital signs is we're going to have both quantitative and qualitative assessments. And so the quantitative assessments are the objective measures. It's going to be things like you know, number of breaths or heartbeats per minute with that. But then we also need a qualitative assessment that is just going to use now words to describe the vital sign that we uh, are assessing and the findings. And so like things like rhythm and strength you will see regularly. So when you take something like the pulse and you were going to document your findings for the pulse, it would be something like 136 beats per minute, irregular rhythm and poor strength. And so it is this combination that then gets to the point where we can get some more information um, that can help in our diagnosis because 136 beats per minute by itself could be caused by a lot of things but an elevated pulse with an irregular rhythm and poor strength uh, suggests shock and so now we have enough information to use this for our assessment so we'll go through each of the vital signs one by one and give some of the highlights you will work on how to actually assess these in lab. So I'm going to primarily focus on normal and abnormal findings uh, within each uh, vital sign. So first is pulse, and pulse is simply the expansion of an artery that you can palpate. And it's obviously created by the contraction of the heart pushing blood through the major arteries. Pulse points then are where you can go about feeling the pulse. And there are many different pulse points within the human body. We will primarily be looking at the uh, femoral and then ulnar or radial pulse. So radial pulse here, right, is gonna be assessed um, in the wrist, this is the most common pulse that you're going to assess uh, in a conscious individual. With that index finger and middle finger, don't use the thumb. You probably heard that your thumb has its own pulse with that. And you need to gently press down on the artery. If you put firm pressure, you will actually occlude the um, artery and affect the pulse itself. The femoral pulse now right, is located in the femoral triangle. You can assess this either standing or supine. You're gonna palpate the skin if at all possible. So you're gonna need a private room or some sort of sheet or toweling for cover. Um, it's always good right, to ask the patient if they're willing to uncumber the proximal medial thigh. It's easiest and best to um, be able to view the skin while you're palpating for your landmarks. But if that is not possible, you can palpate and locate the femoral pulse over clothing. Obviously, more layers of clothing make that difficult. You're gonna locate the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubises. And then you're going to then move over towards the proximal rectal femoris, that's the femoral triangle. The easiest way to do that is if they go into a figure four type position, uh, you'll see the crease there, and you'll be able to find the pulsations of the femoral artery if you just move slightly medial from that location. And again, you'll focus on that more in lab on how to find uh, both of those pulses. As far as pulse rate, right, you have the normal pulse rates that are highly dependent 
on age in order to get the pulse rate you're going to palpate and check the number of times the heart beats uh, per minute and ideally the best record for that is the 30 seconds multiplied by two shorter than that allows for more uh, irregularities within that the more you're multiplying the uh, more air you have but all the way to 60 seconds makes it harder uh, to keep count and so it's actually 30 seconds is recommended and you'll see 30 seconds and multiplying by two as a relatively common way to do that uh, obviously the pulse is also going to be affected by physical activity and uh, if somebody is vigorously exercising um, they will have a elevated pulse as well as if they have been exercising over time they will have a decrease in their resting pulse right and that's part of this athletic heart syndrome aspect where the heart is actually going to change uh, morphologically functionally and electrophysically um, that so it is more efficient and thereby needing less overall pumps to get the same amount of uh, blood through the body other factors that will affect that will include any medical conditions blood loss as you increase blood loss you're going to have to increase the pulse rate to keep the same um, amount of blood flowing stress fear and anxiety obviously affect that as well as body temperature abnormal findings are either tachycardia or bradycardia with tachycardia being over 100 beats per minute uh, obviously this should be expected in athletes that are engaged in physical activity but that would return to normal with rest um, but most of the time elevated heart rates are caused by um, internal bleeding low uh, blood uh, as far as hypoperfusion heat illness dehydration fever pain and anxiety all lead to tachycardic states bradycardia now is beats under 60 uh, beats per minute and it's caused by heart disease uh, different medications will cause bradycardia fatigue weakness dizziness lightheadedness and syncope all will manifest with a decreased pulse rate as far as rhythm and strength the qualitative components with that you have either a regular or irregular heartbeat so you can see a regular is just normal intervals whereas irregular will have a changing interval between beats with uh, each one. Uh, atrial fibrillation is the most common where you'll see rapid irregular twitching of the heart muscle as the most common irregular aspect. As far as strength, you have bounding, weak, and absent. Bounding is a strong, forceful pulse uh, weak obviously is more difficult to attend and then absent is no pulse and you can see reasons for each of those uh, there finally when you get to pairing these you can see a rapid and strong uh, pulse versus a slow and strong pulse different conditions affected with each of those and then uh, rapid and weak and no pulse there so this is where you can see you need both uh, qualitative and quantitative data to help you identify the specific conditions. One thing to consider here with assessing pulse is assessing radiofemoral delay. The main reason that we teach femoral pulse is for this radiofemoral delay, where you're going to uh, palpate the femoral and radial pulse at the same time and you should be able to feel the pulses at the same time if there is a delay uh, in the femoral pulse with that it can be caused by a couple of different things but the main one we're worried about 
is this uh, coarcation of the aorta or a condition called aortic coarcation where we have an abnormal um, narrowing of the aorta. But since the uh, arteries that feed the upper arm go off uh, out of the ascending aorta, you won't have the delay, but there is a delay caused by this pinch point there. And so when doing pre-participation physical exams, and you're doing a femoral pulse, and the reason they ask you to do femoral pulse is to check with that for this potential delay. Respiration is the process of uh, ventilization, which is just exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Obviously, um, oxygen is needed for the uh, fuel molecules. Um, to uh, convert those to energy. That's a uh, product of aerobic metabolism, right? And the byproducts being carbon dioxide and water. And so we exchange those gases within the lung. Inhalation is the active rise of the chest, drawing in of oxygen, whereas exhalation is the passive fall of the chest and blowing off carbon dioxide. There's also active expiration where you contract muscles to do that but inhalation uh, is always active and exhalation can be active or passive one breath is characterized as the a single rise and fall and when we're assessing this we're going to assess the frequency of breathing but we're also then going to get into an observation to determine whether it's even and there is uh, adequate air exchange and breath sounds. So we'll look at that because obviously there are two different lungs. And so we're looking to see if both lungs are working properly as part of our respiration assessment. The uh, respiration rate, like I said, is the frequency a person breathes in one minute. And it's a cycle of inspiration and expiration. Again, 30 seconds is recommended multiplied by two. And it's important when doing this that you count the number of breaths at the same point within the breath cycle. Normally, you would count at the peak of inspiration where you see the maximum rise in the chest and the belly. You can do this at the same time while you continue to palpate um, the pulse and just relocate their arm up to their chest. It will help you. Uh, feel and see the rise and fall of the chest as well as keeping the patient calm so they uh, uh, you can get an accurate assessment. Obviously, it's important that you um, do not have the athlete speaking during this time because that would um, affect the overall respiration rate. And uh, during active activity, right, with that, you're going to see an increase in respiration rate, but that should return to normal within about five to 10 minutes, similar to pulse rate. So as far as abnormal um, findings as with rate, anything below 10 to 12 breaths per minute or above 24 breaths are considered abnormal. Tachypnea is our, our abnormally high, usually associated with shallow breathing due to uh, inadequate time for full air flow with that radiopenia there. Uh, abnormal slowness of breath with that can cause be by a variety of different conditions. The two most commonly that we would see would be a diabetic ketoacidosis or some sort of central nervous system depression um, that can be caused by intracranial bleeding or a uh, head injury. Apnea just simply being uh, the absence of the presence of breathing, and that's obviously a life-threatening situation. And then uh, dyspnea is any difficulty breathing, and we'll see some examples of that as well. As far as assessing the quality of respirations, we're going to be looking at rhythm, depth, and effort, similar 
to uh, pulse rate with regular and irregular uh, rhythms. These are obviously going to be affected by speech, uh, movement, and anxiety levels with that. Um, but we're looking for a regular interval opposed to, in this case, right, two very close breaths and then more spread out with that. As far as depth of breathing, normal depth of breathing with that should be able to carry on a conversation without pausing. And you would see normal equal movements of the chest without any use of accessory muscles. So you shouldn't see any flailing of the chest um, or any contractions of the uh, intercostal muscles during normal breathing. In deep breathing, we're going to have um, larger volumes of air inhaled and exhaled with full expansion of the lungs and shallow being the opposite there, which we see decreased chest expansion, most often caused by some sort of respiratory disease, but also can be a result of poisoning, shock, heat illness, and heart failure. Uh, hyper, hypernia, uh, uh, hyperventilation and hyponia right, are different conditions associated with change in uh, depth, right, where hyper, hyperpnea is deep, rapid labor breathing, hyperventilation then is over breathing, and hypo, hypopnea is shallow, slow breathing. So not the easiest to say there with those, but know those different conditions as well as in your, uh, there's additional videos there talking about these different irregular breathing patterns uh, also below. So take a look at those additional uh, videos below this lecture to see what these types of breathing patterns are. And you'll assess these. Uh, with auscultation, and we'll show how to do that in lab. Continuing on with that, now looking at effort, right? Primarily, you're going to be looking for normal amounts of effort. Like I said, they'd be able to carry out a conversation without uh, pausing. But if you have shallow breathing, uh, we saw that being respiratory disease that, but then the opposite would be labored breathing, which is a medical emergency. It's caused by some sort of airway obstruction, possible heart attack, chest trauma, lung disease, and diabetic emergency. What you'll see is this increase in breathing effort and the need for the use of accessory muscles. Um, you might see nasal flaring and retractions, and it's very noisy in breathing. You may find that they are trying to find a position for the greatest gas exchange. You see tripod position here, which is common. And then more in uh, children, you'll see the sniffing position, where in order to try to get more airflow, they tilt their head back slightly. And this is called, uh, called sniffing position. You might also see noisy breathing or hear it through auscultation. Uh, there's another video again at the bottom of this on abnormal breath sounds, but you can see the presentation and what that would mean uh, there. Next vital sign that we talk about is condition of the skin, color, temperature, overall condition, and turgor. Right? When you're looking at color, this is going to be highly uh, affected by circulation. And so that's what we're really looking for when we're assessing skin. We're looking for abnormal circulations aspects. You can see pale and white uh, being poor circulation, blue being deficient oxygenation of the blood, red or flushed is going to be engorged with blood, so inability to dissipate heat, and yellow is going to be some form of jaundice thing going on there. So in adults, the easiest place to identify and assess skin color is going to be the nail beds, the inner lower eyelids, or uh, muco mucous membranes, as well as the plantar surfaces of the foot. 
um, in children and infants, the plantar surface of the feet or the volar surfaces of the hand uh, can be assessed as well. As far as temperature goes, we're obviously looking for changes in skin temperature and increased body temperature would be um, shown through vasodilation and sweating and cool, a uh, cool body temperature or cool skin temperature. Decreased body temperature would be from vasoconstrictions. Many diseases, lifestyle choices, medications can re restrict peripheral blood flow assessing the skin temperature. You're going to simply feel using the back of your hand on the forehead or the uh, calf or forearm of a child. Normal is obviously just warm. Abnormal with cool skin could be uh, signs of shock, mild hypothermia, or poor circulation. Cold could be from cold exposure, is hypothermia or frostbite, or profound shock. And you see hot is being fever, heat exposure, or sunburn. If you have just isolated hot spots, that could be a sign of infection. And those goosebumps or goose pimples could be chills. Uh, some forms of communicable diseases uh, show goosebumps as well. Cold exposure and or feel. As far as condition, we're just looking now for a normal dry condition. Abnormal conditions could be clammy where you have cool, moist and pale um, skin. This is a reduction of superficial blood flow and sweat from uh, the different glands and is indicative of shock, heat exhaustion, cardiac distress, pain, and anxiety. Moist or wet skin is from superficial vasodilation, from strenuous exercise. It can also be from heat exposure or fever. When you combine some of these together, right, you can have cool and moist skin, which is signs of shock, heart attack, or anxiety. Cold and dry skin are associated with cold exposure or diabetic emergencies. Hot and dry skin are heat exposure, fever, or spinal injuries. And hot and moist are heat exposure, fever, or diabetic emergencies as well. So you can see how these can be combined to give us some ideas of the conditions that are going on in an emergency. Skin turgor is an assessment of the degree of fluid loss or dehydration, and we're looking at the elasticity of the skin. So you're gonna pinch the back of the hand and pinch that skin in a tenting uh, formation. And normal, the skin will immediately snap back to its normal position. If there's a decrease turgor, that means the skin will remain elevated or tented for several uh, seconds. This is indicating a dehydration uh, status from anything from excessive vomiting, diarrhea, increased urination, um, or a corticosteroid reaction. So all sorts of different things can lead to dehydration that would be assessed through a decrease in skin turgor. Pain, talk on whether or not pain is a true vital sign getting within there. Um, there's been a push to have more assessment of pain. Pain can be assessed a number of different ways, um, different scales, right? There's the uh, FACES pain rating scale that uh, allows for um, assessment of pain on a zero to 10 scale without the use of words, but has words there. So, if, you know, using children or illiterate individuals, you can use a pain uh, face rating, right? There are descriptive pain intensity scales, the normal zero to 10 scales, or then the visual analog scale, which is actually just a 10 meter, 10 centimeter line. And what you would do with this is you would ask them to draw a line representing where it is. And the nice thing about the visual analog scale for assessing pain is it's easier to uh, track changes because it's a more real assessment with that because they're marking in different places and you can measure that opposed to if they remember I was at a six, 
and now they're comparing back and forth whether or not uh, that is accurate. So the visual analog scale is probably the most sensitive, um, but the zero to 10 numeric pain intensity scale is probably the easiest with that. Capillary refill is a measure of circulation in tissue perfusion. You're just simply going to press down on the uh, patient's nail bed until it becomes fully blanched or white. You release the pressure and you should record the amount of time for the nail bed to return to normal pink color. Um, normal is less than two seconds. Abnormal is longer than two seconds, which would indicate some sort of dehydration or potential uh, shock. They, in this case here, um, looking at this from an evidence standpoint, it's important to realize delayed capillary refill uh, in the absence of other um, in the absence of other uh, signs probably is unreliable uh, with that. And so the use of cap refill as a vital sign is probably not as helpful as some of the others. Um, more immediate vital signs for injuries are assessment of the pupils. We're going to assess pupils for shape and size and equality and reactivity. When we look at uh, the pupil, right, we're talking about the spherical black center of the eye, and it's, we're going to see changes um, based off of the amount of light. The purpose of constricting the pupil is to control the amount of light that enters the eye. So if you have bright light, you'd have pupil constriction. If you have dim light, you'd have pupil dilation. And this is assessing the function of the brain stem. Uh, normal, right, would be pupils of the same size and shape. You can assess this using a pen light. And a scoria is pupils of not equal size. This can be congenital, where some people just have um, uh, different size uh, pupils uh, normally. can be a result of trauma or medication. So if somebody has anascoria, Right? It should be noted on their pre-participation physical exam, so we know that. Teardrop pupil right here is indicative of a uh, globe rupture to the eye. Dilated pupils, right? so there are pupil charts where you can measure, or, you know, assess based on different things. And here's an example of one. You can just easily Google that as well. But dilated pupils are indicative of a depressed brain function, possible ocular motor nerve trauma, fright, blood loss, drug use, uh, and there sometimes there's uh, eye drops right to dilate the pupils as well with that. But oftentimes we're looking for dilated pupils with a decreased brain function or drug use sign of drug use with that. Uh, you can have constricted pupils as well. Other types of drugs constrict the uh, pupils, um, but there are also diseases associated with a constriction of the pupil. More often, what we will see would be uh, the quality and reactivity to that, assessing the direct and consensual light reflexes. The direct light reflex is going to be when you shine a pen light into the pupil for one to five seconds and you're going to uh, assess the uh, same eye that you shine the light into. Both pupils should constrict, but the direct uh, light reflex is the same. Consensual would be watching and assessing the opposite uh, eye. Abnormal pupillary reactions with that see some of the different classifications of pupillary reaction speed. Oftentimes we're seeing this with, you know, stroke, head trauma, eye injuries, um, or if you have an artificial eye that will cause unequal size. The optic nerve uh, trauma will cause opposite eye constriction with assessed eye dilation with that as well. So you can see some of the other things with that. A fixed and dilated um, pupil 
could be ocular motor nerve trauma. A sluggish pupil could be increased intracranial pressure. Bilateral mid-sized mid-position and non-reactive pupils are indicative of mid-brain trauma. And then if you have a bilaterally fixed dilated and non-reactive pupil, this would be indicative of massive intracranial swe swelling and bleeding. Uh, profound hypoxia or, or brain death with that. So any change in pupils, because we are assessing more brain stem function and the knee and the uh, uh, other important components associated obviously with brain stem function are going to be considered medical emergencies and would need immediate referral. You can see here there's a couple of highlights I would like you to focus on. Here, first one on anscoria, right, as far as the different uh, things with that that's being caused. But you can see it's not the cause of symptoms, and we can see this in about 20% of the population just normally. But there are different uh, associations with that, and then how to interpret these findings. So we'll look at this a little bit when we assess that, but take a look at this highlight from your course text as well then as your PERL or PERLA, different uh, acronyms with this. This is pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. And so this is just a pneumatic finding. Oftentimes you'll see this uh, documented there. Um, it's really not as um, helpful as we think because it is fairly incomplete. And so we need to assess this for more than that. And so you can see here, they have this perla rapid, pearls equal round reactive to light, relative afferent pupillary defect aspects um, with that to assess all of those different components that we were talking about. So take a look at this highlight as well. The last vital sign we're gonna talk about is blood pressure. And blood pressure here, you can see the definition of this, but is the pressure of the blood within the arteries as well as the um, resistance of the arterioles uh, and the elasticity of the walls with that. So we have systolic blood pressure, is the pressure when the heart contracts, and the diastolic blood pressure then um, associated with the pressure when the uh, ventricle relaxes. So you see here, uh, blood pressure is highly sensitive to a bunch of different things with this. And so there are a lot of potential errors going through with this. Um, obviously, if the athlete is uncomfortable or anxious, it's going to affect the measurement. The wrong size of cuff is something that uh, causes a lot of errors, as well as overclothing where people just get lazy with that. There's been shown with different size, everything from um, a difficulty in hearing the sounds, but even if you can hear the sounds, right, you have that increased clothing, so that's an inaccurate pressure uh, with that. The position of the athlete. So when we talk about these different positions, we will see that the position is going to uh, affect the uh, blood pressure severely. Everything down to even uh, crossing your legs has been shown to affect blood pressure. And so then all of these other things, I will not talk about each of them, um, but it is uh, important that when we go through and we talk about this, that you pay particular attention to the procedure to avoid these specific preventable errors in assessing uh, blood pressure. We assess blood pressure with a sphygmometer. Um, with that, you can see the different components there. And then there are different types. A mercury cuff is most common in hospitals and physicians' offices. This is considered the gold standard because it's very durable, it's easy to read, and we do not require adjustments. However, these are more bulky and mercury is toxic and more expensive. Aneroid uh, sphygmometers are now uh, much uh, cheaper. They're lightweight, they're portable, and the pressure gauge can be removable. 
Uh, the main disadvantage is that they can become unreadable and unreliable and need to be readjusted yearly. There are also um, automatic blood pressure cuffs that measure blood pressure uh, electronically. The nice thing with this is it minimizes human error and uh, can be done at the same time with other vital signs. It's also possible to assess blood pressure in the absence of a clinician, and we know that just the presence of the clinician increases blood pressure as well. Disadvantages being they're bulky, they require uh, batteries, and they're very sensitive to being bumped and can uh, get improper readings. Right? And so you can see there are specific problems associated with this, and um, the aneroid uh, cuffs can lead to errors with that. So it's important that when you're assessing blood pressure, specifically in a like pre-participation physical exam situation, that you um, take additional time to make sure that your cuff is calibrated as well as you assess it multiple times uh, before you uh, make too many big recommendations. When we get into determining blood pressure, uh, like we said, the most important thing associated with that is that you're going to have appropriately sized and placed uh, cuff with that, um, and that you wrap it snugly around the arm with the bottom about one inch above the antecubital space. And you want to secure that Velcro, but not over tighten it, increasing the amount of pressure there. You can actually assess blood pressure one of two ways, either via palpation or via auscultation. And palpation is a quick, easy way to uh, get the systolic blood pressure with there, where you're just going to now uh, occlude the uh, artery and you're going to wait till you feel, so you're gonna feel the pulse, then occlude the artery. You're gonna wait till you feel the pulse come back, and that is their systolic um, blood pressure. Uh, ought to get their diastolic, you then have to assess via auscultation. Takes a little bit more time uh, with that. We'll go specifically on how to assess these in lab. We get into normal, uh, readings with this, it's important to realize that normal blood pressures are going to be dependent on age associated with that. But there are other things that are going to affect the readings as well, as far as you know, their um, number and amount of respirations, their current emotional state, their internal temperature, as well as the external temperature. If they're in any pain, right, it's going to increase their blood pressures, it increases their anxiety level. The individual taking the blood pressure, right, as like I said, um, just the presence of another person increases blood pressure opposed to the absence of the individual there with different automatic uh, things that get in there. There are changes associated with um, patient race as well as health status as well. So it's important that we understand what these baselines are and assess that. There are multiple different uh, abnormal findings with that. Hypotension is what we would be seeing um, in a uh, emergency situation most of the time where we have uh, blood pressures below the normative ranges. Uh, we can see this also in a normal situation though with athletes, again, with that athletic heart syndrome. But if it's coupled with trauma, uh, or illness, it can be indicative of an arterial bleed or later stages of shock. So this would be a life-threatening situation if we have a hypotensive individual uh, that's associated with a trauma or an illness, uh, quite possible that we have an, an internal bleeding situation going on. Hypertension is going to be higher than normative ranges in blood pressure. This can be from anywhere from um, arteriosclerosis or abnormal hardening of the arteries to arthrosclerosis, which is narrowing of the arteries by fatty uh, deposits. With that, commonly seen in individuals uh, 55 years or older, but also can be seen with people with a, hyper, with a family history of hypertension 
obesity, history of smoking, uh, heavy drinking is associated with hypertension, uh, diabetes and kidney disease are all um, also associated with hypertension. Women over the age of 35 with a history of oral contraceptive use has also been associated with uh, chronic hypertension. But we can have hypertension in medical illnesses and emergencies as well. Heart attacks, strokes, head traumas, emotional distress, extreme excitement or exertion are also all associated with increases in blood pressure. And so that is the end of our initial discussion on what the different vital signs are. Next time we will talk about when uh, to assess these different vital signs as far as how to incorporate these into a systematic evaluation either in an emergency or a pre-participation setting. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day.